This is Living Waters of Grace, the teaching ministry of Clark Lawfer, Senior Pastor of Calvary Chapel of Westmoreland County of Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Now here's Pastor Clark as he continues teaching through God's Word. My prayer cannot be pure before the Lord if my mind is actively engaged in following thoughts. Now, whenever I pray lots of times, my thoughts hit me. I'm sure yours do too. And all of a sudden, I have a good intention to talk to the Lord, and then I'm way over here somewhere. Does that ever happen to anybody? And God wants me to sense that so that I don't allow those thoughts to be going over there, that I capture them and bring them back to Him. Because I'm either listening to what He's wanting to tell me or I'm listening to what the thoughts are wanting to tell me. Where is your mind rooted? Are you seeking God fully, or are your prayers being invaded by your own thoughts? Sometimes it's hard to discern the difference, isn't it? Pastor Clark speaks today about what it looks like to take every thought captive and to be reminded of God's truths relentlessly. The enemy is tenacious in trying to tackle your mind and take it out of the game. So be on your guard and be determined to not let your own thoughts take over when God wants to speak to you. Now here's Pastor Clark in the book of Proverbs chapter 4 as he continues his message, Demolishing Strongholds That Destroy Lives. The truth is this inner purification and deliverance is a lifelong process and it's called sanctification. And the more we encounter God in his word and truth, the more we want to be transformed. The more I grow and the more the Lord teaches me about the truth of his word, the more I want to get rid of stuff, right? I want to get rid of baggage in my life. I don't want to carry around a bunch of junk and have it manipulate and ruin my life and and the relationships of the people that I, I live before and live with. It tells us in the book of Proverbs that we need to have inner vigilance. It says in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of light. Now, we had a police officer in the first service. He was a state cop. He retired recently. I use him as an illustration because he had to be aware of danger in every situation of his life. When he went out on the uh, patrol, he had to be aware of what was going on in that car, who was in it, uh, was anybody else around. He's going into a neighborhood. Who's around? What windows might have guns in? I mean, he was totally amped up. His his emotions, his uh, sense of... uh, uh, intelligence, everything about him was connected to everything that was occurring. He was very, very aware of his environment. If he wasn't, then there would be tragedy and disaster, not only for him, but for other people. It's like you and me, we're at the red light, and it's happened to many of us. We're looking there, hopefully not texting, but hopefully looking at the uh, the rearview mirror, wondering what's happening behind me. And we see some car coming up about 100 miles an hour, and it has no intention of stopping because they're texting, and they don't know what's going on. And so you see it, and you have a chance because you're aware of the danger. You're vigilant because of the atmosphere. You're going to get out of the way, right? And not get hit, not get killed. And that's what the Lord wants. Take a look at Luke chapter 21, verse 34 for a minute. Jesus is saying this. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life, and that they come upon you unexpectedly. Jesus is saying, be aware of where you're at, what you're thinking, what you're doing, where you're going, where you're hanging out. Don't let your hearts be weighed down with what they were once weighed down with. Many of you can remember what it was like to carouse and be drunk, and and some of us today here today maybe aren't doing that stuff, but we're so weighed down by the cares of this life, that we're missing everything that life's about. And Jesus is saying, you need to take heed, watch yourself, be on guard, have inward attention. And as we begin to pay attention to these thoughts, and that's all they are is thoughts. They're like fish going down the stream. And just because you have a thought doesn't mean it's coming from your heart. It's like Jesus talked about through Paul in Ephesians 6. He said, You're to hold up the shield of faith, which is able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. So the enemy's trying to shoot weird things at us all the time. We have the shield of faith up. Those things bounce off. But some of them hit us, and we begin to absorb those thoughts, and we begin to uh, connect with those thoughts, and that isn't what the Lord wants. As we begin to pay attention to the thoughts, 
and see them as they are, we combine humility, which is the beginning stages of the inward attention of repenting and turning from those thoughts, humbling yourself. I'm not going to buy into that. I'm not going to accept that. I'm not going to receive that. In prayer, with the power then that God will give you to cast down the evil thoughts. It's subjecting of your thoughts to the throne room of God, the stronghold of God that enables your thoughts to rest in what is true. Mark chapter 13, verse 33. Turn there for a moment. Jesus is talking about the day and the hour of his return. No one knows. Take heed then, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. Watch and pray. Now prayer, I'm going to talk about prayer for a minute. We have intercessory prayer here at five o'clock. I'm not an intercessor. I, I attend, but I don't have the gift of intercessory prayer. My prayers last a couple minutes here and there. I'm not a person that sits down and prays for an hour. I've never been that way. That's just the way I am. Now, maybe that's a stronghold that needs to be broken down. I don't know. But, you know, God isn't looking like, well, let me time your prayer. If you pray for an hour, you're really into it. If you pray for five minutes, you aren't. That's a lie. God's looking at the intention of the heart. And so my prayer and your prayer needs to be rooted in where are the thoughts are coming from? Are my thoughts coming from God? Or are my thoughts coming from my strongholds that are there that God wants to break down? Or are my thoughts coming from the evil one? Now, my prayer cannot be pure before the Lord if my mind is actively engaged in following thoughts. Now, whenever I pray lots of times, my thoughts hit me. I'm sure yours do too. And all of a sudden, I have a good intention to talk to the Lord, and then I'm way over here somewhere. Has that ever happened to anybody? And God wants me to sense that so that I don't allow those thoughts to be going over there, that I capture them and bring them back to Him. Because I'm either listening to what He's wanting to tell me or I'm listening to what the thoughts are wanting to tell me. And so I'm either keeping my thoughts on him, keeping my thoughts captive in Christ, that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee because he trusts in thee versus trusting in these thoughts, or I'm allowing these thoughts to grab a hold of me. I'm tired or whatever. When I pray with the guys and the gals in intercession, they're amazing prayer people, and I'm learning how to pray by being with these people. My prayer life has grown exponentially just by being around people that know how to pray. But I have to admit sometimes I'm praying and my mind's wandering or I'm getting tired and I, I pray they don't hear me snoring or, you know, I, I want to get up and I got to walk around to stay awake or something like that. And Jesus talked to the disciples about that when in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, I got something heavy I'm going to deal with here. I'm going to be crucified. They didn't understand. And he catches them and they're sleeping. He several times he catches them sleeping. Can't you pray with me for an hour? And they're probably thinking, Lord, I can't pray in five minutes, let alone an hour. And we're in good company. If, we, if the disciples were like that and God used them, uh, don't be disappointed and discouraged that your prayer life maybe isn't as long and as deep as you'd like it to be because God is using the simplest prayers that you have. I like bullet prayers, prayers that are spontaneous. I'm in a crisis. Someone else is in a crisis. I know there's a situation. I'm in tune with that, and I lift that prayer up to the Lord immediately. When someone asks me about a problem or an issue they have, and they say, please remember me in prayer, I know I'm going to forget, so I pray right then. Let's pray now. Let's give it to the Lord now together. And so the, the prayer is very, very important because if we're not pure in the sense of the prayer, whether it's five minutes or an hour, whatever it might be for your life, and you're not actively engaged in observing what the enemy wants to do to move your thoughts away from keeping your mind upon what it is that God's dealing with you about in regard to prayer, uh, you have to understand that the thoughts are going to distract you. So we must rise above these thoughts by the work of the Holy Spirit. And the images that come into our minds are all lies, and we need to cast these things down. Uh, the essential property of prayer is attention. Without attention, there is no prayer. So think about that. When you go before the throne room of God, you're speaking to the master and the king of the universe. He's listening. He's always listening. He's never like too busy. He's never like, I don't have time. He's listening exactly to what it is you want to say and what you want to speak to him about. But if you're starting to pray and you're talking, all of a sudden like your mind's over here, the Lord's like, well, I'm going to listen to someone else now because you're not even paying attention. You forgot that I'm even here listening. And that's not pure prayer. Without attention, there is no prayer. Now, attention and prayer is very important because 
it's closely linked together uh, the way I am up here today. My body and my soul is here. My soul isn't over there and my body isn't over here. They're united together and they can't stand without the other. So the attention first has to go ahead. And I talked about the police officer. He sent out on a mission and he's got to surveil, use surveillance to look at every situation, every person, every possible uh, bad guy. He's going out like the scout. And he's engaging the potential strongholds that have to be pulled down and have to be dealt with. And strongholds are always tied into issues of sin. You'll find in your own life that the thing you think about the most that disturbs you the most every day is usually some type of sin that you're condoning, you're ignoring, but it's still there, you're playing with it, whatever, that has been there for a long time. And in spiritual combat, we have to understand how serious that is, maybe for the first time, that we don't have to live that way. And so the prayer then follows. Once we scout out what the stronghold is and understand what it is, then we're able to pray and seek the Lord and how to dismantle these strongholds. And as we look to the Lord and as we recognize what the strong, the good news is once you recognize the stronghold, that's the beginning of the liberation. Most of us are so blind that we don't even know what's messing our head up, right? We're just like ignorant of it. But once the Holy Spirit shows us what the stronghold is, then we're able to pray and seek the Lord. And he begins to instantly destroy and exterminate all the evil thoughts with which attention has already been battling. For attention cannot cast them down alone. The Bible tells us that our weapons are mighty through God, not mighty through ourselves. These weapons that we use to pull down all these thoughts are mighty through God in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. It's important to understand that God wants your mind to be free. And I, in countless counseling sessions, dealing with people that are telling me the same thing about the same subject that they've told me numerous times before. They've never moved beyond that stronghold. It's still there. One of the reasons it's still there is that they haven't really come to the understanding and the honesty that that's an issue in their life that God wants to dismantle. Their thought doesn't have to ruin their life anymore. It doesn't have to control them. It doesn't have to uh, uh, overwhelm them anymore. God has a way out of this predicament. And it's by attention, as Proverbs 4.23 says. He will keep you in perfect peace. That's not a lie. That's the truth. Whose mind is stayed upon thee, on him, because you trust in him. So by grace, the weapons of our warfare are not humanistic, they're not psychological, they're supernatural and they're spiritual. And so God wants us to rise above all this condition, thought and emotions that have been established in our life and have our eyes on Jesus Christ, the truth. And by his power, we don't let the imaginations take control. Think about a thought that comes into your head, guys, about work. I think they're going to fire me. Anybody ever have that thought? I think you're going to have a cutback in my job. And I think what, all these things, we, instead of trusting God, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Give no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough evil of itself. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to. We need to speak the word to the lie. The lie is giving you fear. The truth is giving you liberation and freedom. And it's a discipline. I'm not saying this is easy. Nothing in life is easy in regard to developing a deeper walk with God. There's a sacrifice. It doesn't happen automatically. But the good news is it's all empowered by the work of the Holy Spirit. So you're not alone in this. The Holy Spirit is the one that's developing this desire and this heart to speak and call out the lies so that the truth can be manifest and revealed. By his power alone, we don't let the imaginations take control. And as I said, this does take practice to catch yourself when your thoughts are descending to the level of lies. And the only way you're going to catch it is by being attentive, by taking heed, 
by watching yourselves, by being on guard. And we can see the thoughts coming when they start approaching us, trying to capture us. And we have, we have the ability then to cast these thoughts down because all they are is lies. Now, I don't know about you, but when I go to bed at night, I lock the doors of my house. I don't leave the doors open. I don't leave the lights on. I make sure my garage door is shut. Every once in a while, I'll forget, and I can't believe I wasn't, uh, some ax murderer didn't come in in the middle of the night and kill me and Cindy. She said, you believe it? You left the garage door open. What's wrong with you? But I, I, I usually get up, you know, I'm going to make sure that garage door is shut, the doors are locked. You got to block the passages of the lies that enter into your life. You got to make sure your spiritual doors are shut. You don't want these lies to enter in and cause fear in your heart and cause resentment and cause heartache and cause anxiety. And little by little, as you're making sure that all these things are secure and they're shut and they're locked up, God begins to dismantle these strongholds and he begins to cast them down. Someone told me in the first service, they learn that whenever they run into someone they don't like, an enemy and someone that just disturbs them and rubs them the wrong way. She says, Clark, I've learned to pray for them. And as soon as I pray for them, I'm free. Instead of me getting resentful and bitter inside because of something they did or didn't do or whatever, I'm praying for them. And all of a sudden, like, I'm like free. And she says, it's just amazing. I've learned how to do that. And I found that when I don't do that, the stronghold then begins to resurrect itself again. And it's like areas in your life, when God does something and he sets you free from something, don't ever get proud and think you're not going to have the problem again because as soon as the thing is destroyed, the enemy and his minions are trying to rebuild the infrastructure to keep you from being able to experience all that Christ has come to give you in your salvation. Those old things can be rebuilt again very, very quickly. And many times you participate in that rebuilding of those things by the things you begin to think upon and the things you begin to engage in, the things you begin to read, the things you begin to watch and listen. All those things begin to develop an energy in and of themselves to begin to impose themselves in your life as being something that will resurrect itself to bring you down. There's a verse and it talks about this in the scriptures about the, the fortress that the Lord has for us, his stronghold. The stronghold of God. We read about that in Psalm 18 too earlier. And we can ascend to the watchtower of God. In other words, God invites us to come up and get a vantage point from his stronghold, which is safety. We're able to look out at a high vantage point and we can see all these other thoughts and all these insanities below us, always messing up the world, messing up people's lives, trying to mess up our lives. And we can see the enemy in his game trying to establish a new stronghold and trying to rebuild something and repair something that was already cast down. We can catch him in the act of doing it. And we have the capacity then by the Spirit of God to cast down these imaginations. And the way you cast them down is you turn from them again. Metanoia, repentance, change of mind. I'm turning from this thought process and I'm putting my mind in the truth of God's mind, his process. This is about cutting off thoughts that rob you of your peace with God. Thoughts that ruin your lives. And I don't have to ask anybody to raise their hands if they struggle with thoughts that are robbing you of the very existence of what life is to be for you. Christ says, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. That's his heart. That's his desire for every one of us. He doesn't want his kids to be overwhelmed with thoughts that ruin their lives and rob them of everything that he's come to give us, his peace. Now, when the thoughts are there, you don't argue with them, you don't communicate with them, don't focus on them. They're designed to divert, divert your attention from God. The mother who's overwhelmed with the children, she thinks the kids are the ones that are driving her crazy. It's the thought about what's happening that's going to drive her crazy. The kids are kids. It's how we process everything that comes into our life, stress in the home, in the family, in the marriage, kids, work, finances, health, whatever it might be, you got to do something about the thought that isn't from God. It's about cutting these thoughts off. And so you don't yield to these thoughts. Don't allow them to control you. Don't let them, don't let them ruin your day. Let your mind and your will be aligned to God and the thoughts will disappear. They'll begin to disintegrate. 
And I'm not talking from theory. I got to do this every second of my life. Before I get ready to preach up here, you wouldn't believe the thoughts I'm bombarded with. They're insane. They're all lies. Those people don't care what you have to say today. They're bored. They just want to sit and go through the motions and get out of here as soon as possible. There's no sense. You don't have anything to tell those people they're going to. Who do you think you are? You shouldn't even be doing that. All these lies. What if I listened to that? I'd be sneaking out the back door. You're like, where's the pastor today? I don't know. I saw him riding down the road. (laughs) Because my thoughts determine my actions, right? But I got to cast those thoughts down and say, Lord, this is your thought. Your word won't return void. It'll accomplish the purposes for which you send it. And so it's like the guy that runs the railroad tracks and he switches the signal and the train starts going down the wrong track. And the engineer says, we're going the wrong way. So he gets on the phone, hooks it up again. Hey, you got to get us back, switch us back to the other track. We're going the wrong, oh yeah, I made a mistake. I'll get you back on the right track. And we have the capacity to switch the track of the thinking of our mind just by turning from the thought and turning toward the Lord. Remember, the weapons we have are mighty through God. They're not mighty through us. They're mighty through God. He's the one that has the power to pull down the strongholds. In closing, as the worship team comes forward, the tools of our, of our calling, if you may, are powerful. They're God's tools. And God's tools are designed for demolishing the entire, uh, the entire lie of the corrupt culture we live in. The culture you and I live in is massively corrupt. It's a massively corrupt culture. And every one of us have been impacted by the culture. And God uses these weapons to smash down these warped philosophies of this culture. He's the one that tears down the barriers that have been erected against the truth of God. And so it's really important to to allow this teaching today to grab hold of your, your mind. I'd encourage you to listen to it over and over and over again. Get it down, get it down, get it down. Don't let it just like slip away and say, oh, that was an interesting message. Let it take control of your heart so that you are focused from this day forward going out that you're not going to let your thoughts determine your life. You're going to control those thoughts by the power of the Holy Spirit so that you have God's thoughts, not the thoughts that are determining where you're going to go if you listen to them and how you're going to live and how you're going to react. You want God's supernatural power to invade your mind to such an extent that you're going to know from this day forward, I'm going to refuse by the grace of God to let my mind think upon anything else but Jesus. I'm going to keep my mind upon him. It's like uh, Peter, he's in the water and he, you know, he's in the boat first and then he's wanting to walk on water. He's all excited about the opportunity to walk on water. He sees Jesus, come on out. Yeah, come on out. And so he gets out and for a couple seconds, he's actually walking on water. That would be so cool, wouldn't it? And all of a sudden he sees the wind, the thoughts. He sees the waves, the thoughts. This is dangerous. What am I doing? Am I crazy? And he's got his eyes off the Lord. And all of a sudden what happens? He starts sinking. And that's what happens in our lives. As soon as we get our eyes off the Lord, even for a second, we start sinking. Keep that in mind. Keep your eyes on him. And the outcome will be amazing. It'll be incredible. This world can be a tough place to live in, can it? Between natural disasters, relationship squabbles, and heartache, it can be downright discouraging and dismal looking. If you feel like this, or if something is weighing heavy, please connect with us. We want to pray with you. We want you to know you're not alone. We want to walk alongside you. Go to calvarychapelonline.com right now. Locate the contact tab. Once there, fill out the prayer request form. In case this gives you pause, don't let it. Everything is confidential and doesn't go beyond the prayer team. That website again is calvarychapelonline.com. 
As soon as you're done, we'd implore you not to leave that site too quickly. We have a variety of ways for you to either learn more about us or stay connected or do both. Just click on whatever tab catches your eye and begin reading. Living Waters of Grace is a radio ministry based out of Greensburg, Pennsylvania and Calvary Chapel, Westmoreland. This ministry is also listener supported. We don't take that for granted. So for that, we say thank you and we trust that you've grown leaps and bounds in your faith and service to Jesus Christ, our Lord. If you're in the area, why don't you accept our invitation to personally attend our Sunday morning service at 1030? There's plenty of room for you, and we're always excited to meet another follower of Jesus. More information can be found at calvarychapelonline.com. We look forward to seeing you soon. We also want to say thank you for spending part of your time with us. Be sure to come back again for another message in 2 Corinthians like this one, here on Living Waters of Grace.